My name is David Peacock from the University of Bergen in Norway, and I am presenting about uh, what's, what we call the seven pillars of wisdom. And it's uh, really summing up some of my research over the last few years about um, fracture systems, fault systems, how you define some of the terminology, how you describe these sorts of uh, fracture systems. My main work has been on very brittle structures, but the same can really be applied to uh, other systems, other type of structures, much more duct ductile structures, for example. So um, I'm, I'm going to be talking about these, what we call the seven pillars. And it's uh, the seven pillars are, are these. They're different types of geological or structural geological analysis. And um, I, I think that these are very, very useful for helping to uh, organized structural geology. For example, here at the bottom, you see that um, if you if you start off, you have data, some problems you want to test, some hypotheses you want to test, and there are these different types of analysis that you can undertake. So, a basic geological description, geometry and topology is another column, age relationships, kinematics, tectonics, mechanics, and fluid flow, and these different types of analysis are really important because they they help you to, to really understand structural analysis and help you make uh, geological interpretations. And I'll, I'll, I'll go through this in the talk. So the, the aims of this talk are to define these seven types of structural analysis, these seven pillars of wisdom, to illustrate how these types of analysis are related to each other, and to show that each type of analysis typically has its own terminology. Often these terminologies are, are sort of muddled up as the, as the analyses are muddled up. And we think that the, these uh, terms should be kind of separated and they should be understood in the context of the seven pillars. And we, what I'll do is also illustrate how muddling the analysis types and the terminologies can be very problematic. It can lead to some muddled thinking and some uh, incorrect results. So there are some references for this work. Uh, th this is the, the first one. This is a, a, a paper from a couple of years ago. It's a, a glossary of faults and fracture networks. And the it, writing this paper really um, made me think very much about these um, how the types of structural analysis. And it was my uh, co-author, my PhD supervisor and co-author, Dave Sanderson at the University of Southampton, who really came up with the idea of separating this glossary into um, different types of terms. So he, he suggested that we could use uh, sort of geological terms like fault and vein. We could use um, geometric terms. We could use kinematic terms, mechanical terms, tectonic terms. And the, that really got me thinking about how you would use that sort of information and that led to this this other paper that's uh, just recently very very recently been published structural analysis and fraction network characterization seven pillars of wisdom so it's just just been published in earth science reviews with dave sanderson as the co-author and the idea there is is um, really to, to 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 sort of explain how if you if you are trying to carry out a structural analysis it's worth thinking in terms of these analysis types and that's the, the the main part of this talk. So uh, I, I give particular credit to Dave Sanderson for, for 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 developing these ideas. So the field area, the 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 field area that I ha have had through most of my career has been on the Somerset coast. It's a fantastic area of, of structural geology. There's a, a approximately 18 kilometer stretch of coastline between Blue Anchor and Lilstock, which is some some really fantastic geology there. Uh, the the exposures are of liassic limestones and shales, and there's also some some Triassic marls and, and sandstones there. But it's it's a really world class piece of geology. You, you get a hint of that from the uh, from the Google Earth, for example. Note there's a, a 20 meter scale bar here. It's not not very clear, but this is part of that coast. And you see the 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 way the beds fold round and they're faulted. You get a, a strong hint of how good the geology is just by looking at these sorts of um, sorts of images on Google Earth or Google Maps. But if you go in even more detail, for example, here this is a, a, a photo montage taken using a, a drone. Notice the scale bar here, 20 meters. Uh, 
there's a fault cutting across the the beach and this amazing pattern of of joints that occur on this limestone bedding plain it's a fantastic area for for geology it's easily accessible it's a relatively safe place to work. You, you've got to watch out for the tides, but the, the, the tide range is the second highest in the world. It can cause uh, some problems, but it also helps keep the exposures fresh and clear because the, the, um, the, the, it's, it's washed by the tides in the occasional storm. So there's some fantastic exposure here. It's, um, the, the new, and the new drone technology helps you make these de very detailed maps. I'm hoping that I will be able to put these images uh, on 3D um, virtual outcrops. I'll, I will hope to make them available on the Safari database within the next few months or year or so. But um, I, I, I'm keen that people use this data set because it's, it's some fantastic stuff here that people can use. So let's look at even, even in more detail here. It's again a, a photo montage from a drone. Notice the scale bar here. And I'll be using this particular part of a, a photo montage to, to illustrate these different types of structural analysis. So let's start off with the, the first pillar, the, 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 the first pillar, the basic geological description, the geological description that you might want to undertake. And I, I think it's really important to emphasize this because it's often neglected. It, it, a lot of a lot of uh, work at the moment seems to sort of jump this step. So, what sort of thing might you want to describe as a basic geological description? Well, you might want to say, for example, there's here there's a normal fault zone. Here there are some veins, dextral fault cutting the the, the strike slip fault, and there's also joints there. These are different types of fracture. The to defining these geologically, you you say what type of fracture there is that that there, there are present. One one of the drivers for this work was that. I'm seeing a lot of papers published, a lot of manuscripts that I'm reviewing, where they talk very vaguely about fracture. So they would say, "In we went to the field, we measured fractures, and we come up with this result." And it's like, well, what do you mean by fracture? Is the fracture is such a broad term? The geological fractures include faults, veins, joints, dikes, sills. There's all types of all sorts of types of fracture occur, and to miss that out is to, to miss that basic geological description really can lead to some problems in the subsequent analysis. And I'll, I'll give an example of that towards the end of the talk, how the um, you, if you miss this basic step, you come up with some results that are, are, are really flawed. So the, you, you really need to start off by by describing what type of structures you you, you have. So let's go give a basic geological description. The type of description you might give if you're on a, a field trip, you're leading students into into an area like this. You you describe the sort of things that you're seeing that they will see. So the, these are some of the, the structures you get on the coast. There's some there's some nice folding that's occurring. You know, so the beds curve around here. There's there's normal faults related to the folding. There's reverse reactivation of some of the faults. There's some strike slip faults, uh, lots of calcite veins, and networks of joints. So these are these are things that uh, uh, that you can see that are present. And it's worth saying rather than just it's a fracture, you say what type of fracture it is. To me, saying it's a fracture is a bit like saying that you own a pet mammal. So if you if you say that I just bought a pet mammal, people say, what do you mean? I mean, is it a dog, a cat, or what is it? And you, you've got to saying fracture is really quite that vague. There are certain, some circumstances where you might want to use the term fracture, but in most cases, I think it's really important to say what type of fracture you mean. So, the in this pillar one, this this basic geological description, the uses of this, it's you you might want to use this basic geological description, for example, during during field work. It's the sort of thing that you might do when you're in the field. You, you, you make notes of what structures are present and give a, what, what ages of rocks are present, what type of rocks are present, those sorts of basic geological descriptions. And it is the foundation of subsequent pillars. So the next pillars really should be based on this basic geological description. Typical terms used, you might want to use terms like fault, joint, vein for individual structures or for the relationships between them. You might want to talk about fault zones, 
imbricates, duplexes, etc. So these are th these are terms that describe relationships between individual structures. The danger of missing this step, the subsequent work that you do lacks any basis in geological reality. So if you just talk about fractures, you haven't said what type of fractures they are, the work is flawed. So let's move on to the second pillar, which is geometry and topology. These are descriptions of the arrangement of structures. So, so how they how they fit together, the patterns they create. Uh, I won't talk in detail about um, about topology. Um, the, the, there's been a series of papers published. The that they are referenced, or some of them are referenced in the in the, in the recent Earth Science Review paper. But um, I'll, I'll illustrate sort of some basic topology in, in the next couple of slides. Now. Geometric and topological descriptions, the, as I say, these, these really um, relate the, the, the structures to each other. So you might want to say, for example, things like how the veins are clustered around the normal faults, how the joints are not clustered around faults. These are kind of geometric descriptions. These are ideally a quantification of the relationships between structures and, and the patterns that you see. So, for example, with, the, the, with fracture networks you see on the Somerset coast, you get some fractures that are, are isolated but but more commonly you're getting these different types of networks of fractures that for example some ladder joints here there's one set of joints with another set cutting between them sometimes you get radial patterns sometimes you get concentric patterns of fractures other times you get apparently random fracture networks so the, 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 you, you're trying to describe the relationships between different types of structures in, in the, the geometric descriptions you might want to use things like stereonets to, to illustrate that, rows diagrams to illustrate that, or um, some so, so mapping. There, there are ways to describe the, the geometry and the topology. So, for example, here, um, in this example, there's some, some veins clustered around a strike slip fault here. This is a, a scan line across a fault zone showing joints in relation to that scan line. The joints don't increase in frequency towards the fault. I'll talk more about that later. So the, um, this, this is an illustration of the, of the sort of geometric distribution of, of, of joints in relation to a fault. This is, again is that satellite image or sorry, drone images of um, a, a fault zone with radiating patterns of, of joints. So you might want to describe some of these, the, these features, the, the curving joints, the way they relate to the fault zone. These are, these are geometric descriptions. Topology. Uh, what you're trying to do here is to illustrate how a, a network of, of fractures interact with each other or connect to each other. So these are different types of connections. The red triangles are what are called Y nodes, where one fracture abuts another one. The green points are called I nodes, where a fracture dies out into the rock. Here you are looking, you, you're starting to get towards the chronology of the fractures. The red fractures are the early ones. The yellow ones are the later ones, and the green ones are the the the, the, the third set, and then there's a fourth set you can identify here. So you you're, you're really just trying to sort identify the 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 relationships between different components of the network. So geometry and topology, the the uses of this is for for quantitative description. So if you want to get a quantitative description of of a fraction network, for example, you, there, there are different parameters you might want to describe is the basis of subsequent pillars that were on information about sizes and orientations of structures. So for example, well, I'll come to the, to the next one, which is about the age relationships. I'll show you in a simple way how, how you rate the geometry and topology to the ages of the structures. Typical terms used for individual fractures or individual structures include things like aperture, branch, tip. Um, for, for, for sets of structures, branch, conjugate, on echelon, those sorts of descriptive terms for how uh, sets of structures relate to each other. The danger in, in missing this step is that you have a lack of knowledge about the geometries of structures and their relationships that really hinder the, the subsequent pillars that or the subsequent studies that you might want to carry out. So let's take the, the, the next step to illustrate that, which is age relationships. So 
it's, a, it's, it's often a fundamental part of, of geology, not just structural geology, but um, all other branches of geology that you, you're trying to work out age relationships. You're putting it into the context of the geological history. So what can you say about age relationships here? There's veins clustered around the normal faults. The, these calcite veins seem to be synchronous with the normal faulting. There's a strike slip fault cutting the, the normal fault in the veins. And then the joints post-date the faults. So you, you, you're looking at the geometries and the topology to work out the, the relative ages. If you have radiometric dating, for example, you, you might be able to work out the absolute ages of veins. If you have seismic data and you, you understand the stratigraphy, you might be able to work out the, the absolute ages. But, but often you're, you're relying on relative ages based on geometries and topologies. So here, this is, this is a field photograph of that same um, image that I just showed. And here you can see the, this, this fault cutting the, the normal fault in the veins. And here you, you're seeing joints cutting across those strike slip faults. They either abut them or cut across them. The, the joints post-date the strike slip faults. So you, you can build up as you can start to build up a geological history of normal faulting, then strike slip faulting, then joints, just by using these simple observations. Now, often people do sort of miss out this this step that they that um, they they don't work out the, the relative ages of structures, and then they kind of put them all together, and that, that often happens with people looking at, um, for example, if they just put veins and joints together as as, um, as fractures, then they're missing out the important point that the often the veins are later, sorry, the veins are older than the joints. The veins indicate there's been a phase of mineralization and fluid flow. The joints are indicating that there's not been that mineralization. Often, as in this case here. So, the age relationships is used to determine relative or absolute ages of structures and the deformation history. It is the basis of other pillars that are on information, information about the histories. So, for example, tectonics, you need information about the history of the structures to, uh, to understand the tectonic history. The dangers of missing this step include that you, you can make mi mistakes in understanding the kinematics, the tectonics, the mechanics of the rock. So, for example, if you lump all the structures together, they're different ages, you can't possibly understand the kinematic history of that um, of those rocks. Pillar four, kinematics. So kinematics is um, something that um, is people have been obsessed about over the over the years. Uh, so particularly through the 1950s, 60s, 70s, people were undertaking strain analysis, quantifying strain. But um, more recently, it's, it's um, kinematic history has been about, for example, faults, uh, quantifying the amount of strain related to faults, amount of displacements and deformation uh, in thrust belts or normal fault systems, strike slip fault systems. So uh, kinematics is, is really just relating the, the, the structures you see to the, to the deformation, the, the displacements and strain involved. So what can be said about something like this? The, these normal faults are related to roughly north, northeast, south, southwest extension. The strike slip faults related to north, northeast, south, southwest contraction. And the joints represent roughly equal extension in, in all horizontal directions. So you can, you can get some idea of the strains that the rocks have undergone. Ideally, you'd want to quantify those strains. To, to give a, a sort of proper kinematic analysis. You might want to illustrate that with, for example, um, fault slip data. This is a, uh, these, these are sets of stereo nets for the initial normal faults, the reverse reactivated normal faults, and the strike slip faults to, to work out the, the uh, strains involved, the strain orientations. This is kind of mixed up a bit with uh, paleo stress orientation analysis. So often people would um, use the kinematic data to, to infer the stresses. So the Ongelier type method of calculating the, the mean stresses, mean stress directions involved. But th this is really the using strain data to, to estimate stresses, or at least stress orientations. So there's a bit of an overlap there. Now, 
the, the, the kinematics, you, you, you would do this sort of analysis to, to quantify the orientations and the magnitudes of the strains or displacements. You would use this as a basis for, um, for pillars that rely on information about strains, especially tectonics and mechanics. So to, to understand the tectonics and the mechanics, you really need to understand, have some understanding of the kinematics involved. It's, it's really hard to get a proper tectonic or mechanical model without understanding the strains. Typical terms used include things like dip slip, strike slip, extension, uh, contraction. For sets of structures, you might want to you turn about you might want to talk about antithetic relationships, interaction, relay ramps. These are these are sort of kinematic terms. The danger of missing this step is that you can't really understand the mechanics and the tectonics without understanding the strains. Usually, the the the, the, the mechanics and the tectonics rely on some understanding of the strains and the kinematics. So tectonics. Let's let's move on to the fifth column, the fifth pillar. Uh, and it is tectonics. So, what can you? How can you relate this sort of these sorts of structures to the tectonics? Well, plate tectonics is incredibly important for, for, for geology, structural geology, and all other branches of geology because it gives a framework for understanding structures. And structures like this have an interesting kind of circular relationship with tectonics. That tectonics is is uh, understood in terms of the, the structures that produce. You use these structures to understand the tectonics. But knowledge of the tectonics can help you understand the structures that you see. So, for example, here we have a set of normal faults and related veins indicating roughly north-south extension. You have a set of strike slip faults indicating roughly north-south contraction. And those can be understood in terms of the tectonic processes of the, 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 that the region has undergone. So in this upper graph, there's an upper, upper map, there's a... Uh, you can see a series of Mesozoic basins across the British Isles with these, marked with these circles. There's a whole series of network of basins that um, indicate Mesozoic extension and sort of network of extension, roughly north-south extension in the Bristol Channel Basin. So these are related to tectonic processes that operated in the in the northwestern Europe during the Mesozoic. This, this sort of regional pattern of extension that included the the North Sea, the, the, the Viking Graben, and uh, offshore um, offshore British Isles and, and, and France. So there's, there's a series of uh, extension uh, extensional basins that developed during the Mesozoic. During the Alpine Deformation, there, there's sort of kind of patchy development of, of reactivation structures, inversion structures. Uh, for example, in, in the Weald and the Wessex Basin, there's some fantastic exposures of inverted normal faults. And in the Bristol Channel, Many of the faults have been inverted, partly inverted. There's reverse reactivation, normal faults. And these are related to, or have been related to the alpine stresses that have also had some reactivation of, of some of these faults. For example, the Cothelstone fault, the Stickle Path fault, these major strike slip faults that were reactivated during the alpine deformation. So you can understand the structures you see on the Somerset coast in terms of regional tectonic processes. So tectonics, it's useful for understanding how structures relate to plate tectonic deformation, and it provides a framework for understanding geological processes. Understanding tectonics has particular links to the, the timing of deformation, the, the kinematics and the mechanics of deformation. The danger of missing this step is that the temporal and other relationships between structures is not properly understood. And you, you really just don't understand the context of the structures. So the tectonics really provides a context to understanding the structures you observe. And it's useful to, to interpret them in terms of tectonics. Mechanics. Now, some people, it has been said that mechanics is kind of the highest level of understanding of uh, structural geology, that uh, if you don't understand the mechanics, you don't really understand the structural geology. And I, I think that's... There might be some truth in that sometimes, but a lot of the time, I think um, you, you you might want to carry out an analysis that that doesn't really necessarily worry too much about the mechanics. That you might be interested in, uh, I, I don't know. If you're just interested in understanding the tectonic history of an area, you might not want to get too much involved in the mechanics. But the mechanics is it, it is a, a important uh, analytical tool. It's an important way of thinking about structural development. <laughs> 
So in this case, you, you might infer the stress system involved in the normal faulting, the stress system involved in the strike stick faulting, and the stress system involved in the, in the joints, the joint development. So you're understanding the mechanics, the, the, you're understanding the stress systems, the rheology involved in the, in the deformation. And so with, um, th th this is showing just some illustrations of how the rheology of the shell has, has changed during the deformation. So during the early normal faulting, sometimes the, the, the shell was very fluid and it filled, filled in these puller parts. Sometimes it was during the normal faulting, it was um, still fairly ductile, but it was, you, you're able to get these quite nice damage zones developed in the shale. By the time of the strike slip faulting, the, the shale was quite brittle and you get these nice veins developed. And then the jointing, the, by the time of the jointing, the, the shale was brittle enough to, to undergo the, this sort of fracturing. So you can, you can work out a, you, you can relate the structures you see to the rheological properties, the mechanical properties. So the use of this is to, is to understand the conditions and under which structures develop. It gives an understanding of how structures form, so it may help in understanding the, the timings, the kinematics, the tectonics and the fluid flow. And typical terms used might be things like interaction, linkage, damage, rheology, stress. So you use a series of terms related particularly to mechanical behavior. The dangers of missing this step include an incomplete understanding of the mechanics that involved that, that, that were involved during the deformation. So you might want to understand the mechanics, particularly for things like fluid flow and tectonic understanding. That leads on to the to the final pillar, which is fluid flow. So what can you say about paleo fluid flow or present day fluid flow from an example like this? Well, the veins around the normal fault indicate that there was a phase of calcite mineralization. There's also calcite veins around and along the strike slip fault, indicating perhaps a second phase of mineralization. The joints are open, so they post-date the mineralization. So you see how that links into the to, to understanding the timings. But you can get a basic understanding of the fluid flow by just, just looking at the structures and the mineralization involved. And you get a hint from this that if you just talk about all, all the fractures together, you, you, you lump the veins and the joints together, you're missing important information about the history and the fluid flow of those and the fluid flow history of those fractures. So just some, some field photographs of those There's calcite along the, the normal faults, calcite along and around these the strike slip faults. And here you're seeing some alteration around some of the the joints you, this is fairly common in somerset that you're getting this sort of brown discolorization around the joints this there's indicating there's been some reaction with the chemo with the fluids within those joints so the that's that the fluid is having some effect on the on the wall rocks notice that there isn't this brown discolorization around the the joints which it, sorry around the veins which is indicating a different fluid flow history why this is important well so many industries rely on um, fluid flow through rock, and you need to understand the uh, the, the, the fracture systems to, to, and, and the fluid flow through them to, to do things like reservoir modeling for the oil industry, for uh, nuclear waste repositories, for uh, hydrogeology, for geothermal energy. So there's a lot of industry, a lot of interest in industry in understanding fluid flow through fracture systems. So you need to get the, the analysis right. Fluid flow is um, it's useful for relating structures to, to fluid flow through rock. It depends very much on the previous pillars, but it can also help those pillars. So for example, the, the, the fluid flow, if you've got evidence of fluid flow, it helps understand the age relationships. Typical terms used include things like porosity, permeability, and connectivity. The danger of missing this step is you, you lack knowledge about how fluids relate to deformation. So, for example, earthquakes and, and faulting is often rela related to, to fluid pressures and fluid flow. Hubbard and Ruby showed it very nicely in the 1950s and a series of paper, papers by Rick Simpson through the 80s, 90s, uh, to the present day is, is showing the importance of fluids in, in brittle deformation. So just, just to finish off, the, the, an example of a uh, the sort of thing that people do that is, is really quite muddled and does cause all sorts of problems. This is the Price 1966 models for model for joints around a fold. And this 
even though it's more than 50 years old, this still kind of captures the imagination. People still use this model a lot. I've never seen an example that is convincing that shows this sort of behavior. And the idea is that you're getting joints that are roughly parallel to the fold hinge, you're getting joints that are roughly perpendicular to the fold hinge, and you're getting these conjugate joints. There's all sorts of problems with conjugate joints because it implies that they're shear failures, shear fractures, and if they're a shear fracture, they should be called a, a, a fault rather than a, a joint. There was a, a very nice um, paper by Paul Ardnadin in 1988 that um, describes this. But this, this model is still being used and, and people still um, r relate the deformation around a fold to, to this sort of pattern. And it gets, gets important because people are using this sort of idea as a kind of proxy for uh, developing um, fracture patterns within a, a reservoir model. So the type of model that I showed you earlier, where there's, uh, people are building a, a reservoir model, they might want to use things like curvature to, uh, within the folds to, to to look at things like fracture frequencies. They might use that the, 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 the fold geometry to predict the orientations of the fractures, the joints. But how realistic is this model? Well, the type of example I see from Somerset and all sorts of other places I've been is that there's a this nice monocline here. It's a very gentle structure. In the monocline, the, the, the steep limb of the monocline, there's a ser series of calcite veins. These are related to the, jo to, to the folding. The joints are not obviously related to the folding. They, the, the joints post-date the folding. So they don't show these simple relationships shown by the price model. They don't show these simple relationships to the fold. They, it's a much more nuanced, subtle effect that the fold is having on the, on the jointing. You need to understand the relative ages of the structures, that their, their, their kinematics, their mechanics, if you're really going to make a, a proper reservoir model. So if you're missing out the steps, you're missing out understanding of the, the timings, for example, the, the, the kinematics, you don't build a proper model. So you're in the case of reservoir model, the reservoir model would just be simply wrong. So you need to, to, to use each of these steps properly, individually to, to, um, to, to make a proper model. So the benefits of this approach are firstly that the, the, the methods and terminology are clearly defined. You're separating out, separating out these different types of study. The focus is on solving particular problems. So if you want to, for example, um, understand the flow, like your flow pattern in the rocks, then you know what needs to go in it. You need you 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 know using this approach, you you know how you go about attacking attacking this problem. It enables studies to be crafted to solve those particular problems. So you know how what components you need to to understand the the, the problem you're trying to address. Just to, to finish off, sort of possible developments of this work. Uh, so something that I'm quite interested in is is using this for this approach with seismic interpretation because seismic interpretation using a particular data set, you need to understand it in particular ways. You, you, there are things you can and can't do with seismic data. And I think using this seven pillars approach would really help with seismic interpretation. It's straying way outside my field, but um, I think a similar approach can be used in sedimentology because there's often a model in, in the different types of analysis that, that, that are undertaken, particularly sequence stratigraphy. People are kind of taking bits and pieces of other type of analysis, putting them into sequence stratigraphy, and coming up with with solutions that are, are often flawed. Now, just a final note about um, the benefits of this approach, how this could be used in teaching. Now, one thing that frustrates me is if, if you get any textbook or most university geology courses, they, they have a particular pattern. They tend to start off with quite abstract concepts like stress, and then they move on to strain, then rheology, and then they move on to particular tectonic settings, extensional, contractional settings. And I think you lose the students very early on because you're trying to show them things like stress and strain and rheology, and they get completely puzzled. But if you use the, the seven pillars approach, what you're doing is you're, you're explaining the methods and terminology with reference to practical problems. And so you're not just sort of jumping into things like more circles and strain analysis because these are quite abstract concepts. I think that you can introduce those those things like more circles and stereonets in the context of trying to solve particular problems and particular analytical types, study types that you're trying to carry out.
The emphasis is placed on the clarity of different analysis types. So it answers such questions as why do I need to learn about serenades? Why do I need to learn about more diagrams? You, you're, you're actually showing them why they need to know this. The focus is on problem solving. So, for example, what do the structures tell us about fluid flow? It helps you tackle those sorts of problems. Hypothesis, te hypothesis testing is highlighted. Is there likely to be enhanced fluid flow around these faults? You can, you can test that sort of hypothesis. And it gives a coherent approach to uh, developing a study. So it shows you how the, the, the steps, the, the different an analytical types you might want to carry out to understand the tectonic history of an area, for example. So I think that the this seven pillars approach has has lots and lots of benefits for, for, for professional geologists and for students. It really hopefully gives a way forward, at least gives a, a sort of um, a framework for, for geologists, structural geologists to to use all these different techniques and the terminology. Thank you.